Buddhas more, that the substance of the universe is coextensive with their own Buddha nature. Yet because their minds are clouded with delusion they see themselves confronted by a world of individual entities. Once they establish firm belief in the reality of the Buddha nature, they are driven to discover it with all the force of their being. Just as Enyadatta was never without her head, so are we never separate from our essential Buddha nature whether we are enlightened or not. But of this we are unaware. We are like Enyadatta when her friends told her, Don't be absurd, you have always had your head. It is an illusion to think otherwise. The discovery of our true nature can be compared to any added as discovery of her head. But what have we discovered? Only that we have never been without it. Nonetheless we are ecstatic, as she was at the finding of her head. When the ecstasy recedes, we realize we have acquired nothing extraordinary, and certainly nothing peculiar. Only now everything is utterly natural. Nine cause and effect are one you cannot hope to comprehend the exalted nature of Zen without understanding this lecture on Inga Ichinyo, the meaning of which is that cause and effect are one. This expression comes from Heikyuan Zenji's chant in praise of Zazen. Bear in mind that this lecture will not be an explanation of cause and effect in the broad sense but only in relation to the practice of Zazen. Strictly speaking, you ought not to think of Zazen in terms of time. While it is generally true that if you do Zazen for a year it will have an effect equal to a year's effort, and that if you practice Zazen for ten years it will produce an effect proportionate to ten years' effort, yet the results of Zazen in terms of enlightenment cannot be measured by the length of your practice. The fact is, some have gained deep enlightenment after only a few years' practice, while others have practiced as long as ten years without experiencing enlightenment. From the commencement of practice one proceeds upward in clearly differentiated stages which can be considered a ladder of cause and effect. The word inga, meaning cause and effect, implies both degree and differentiation, while ichinyo signifies equality or sameness or oneness. Thus while there are many stages corresponding to the length of practice, at every one of these different stages the mind substance is the same as that of a Buddha. Therefore we say cause and effect are one. Until Satori awakening, however, you cannot expect to have a deep inner understanding of Inga. Now let us relate this to the parable of Enyadatta, of which I spoke earlier. The time she saw no head reflected in her mirror and rushed about wildly looking for it this is the first, or bottom, step. When her friends tied her to a pillar and insisted she had a head, when she began to think, possibly this is so, when they whacked her. And she yelled ouch and realized she had a head after all, when she rejoiced at finding it, when finally her joy abetted and having a head felt so natural that she no longer thought about it all these are different steps and degrees of progression when viewed retrospectively, that is. At every one of these stages she was never without her head, of course, but this she realized only after she had found it. In the same way, after enlightenment we realize that from the very first we were never without Buddha nature. And just as it was necessary for Enyadatta to go through all these phases in order to grasp the fact that she had always had a head, so we must pass through successive stages of Zazen in order to apprehend directly our true nature. These successive steps are causally related, but the fact that we are intrinsically Buddha, which in the parable is Enyadatta's realization that she had always had a head this is equality, or undifferentiation. Thus Dogen Zenji in his Shobogenzo states, the Zazen of even beginners manifests the whole of their essential nature. He is saying here that correct Zazen is the actualization of the Bodhi mind, the mind in which we all are in doubt. This Zazen is Sejaho, wherein the way of the Buddha suffuses your entire being and enters into the whole of your life. Although we are unaware of all this at first, as our practice progresses we gradually acquire understanding and insight, and finally, with enlightenment, wake up to the fact that Zazen is the actualization of our inherently pure Buddha nature, whether we are enlightened or not. Ten oneness and manyness when you have Kensho you see into the world of oneness or equality and this realization can be either shallow or deep, usually a first Kensho is shallow. In either case, you still do not understand the world of differentiation, the world that people ordinarily assume they do understand. 
As you continue your practice on subsequent koans, your awareness of the world of oneness, of non-differentiation, becomes clearer, and since it is through this world of oneness that you are seeing the world of differentiation, this latter also becomes clearer. At the beginning, the perception of oneness is not distinct there is still the idea of something confronting me. With deepening practice this barrier gradually dissolves. Even so, the feeling that others are actually oneself is still weak, and this is particularly true when these others have qualities we do not like. With a shallow kensho we resist the feeling that such people are indeed oneself. With further training, though, you are able to live a life of equality and to see that even people whom you recognize as having negative characteristics are not less than yourself. When you truly realize the world of oneness, you could not fight another even if that other wanted to kill you, for that person is nothing less than a manifestation of yourself. It would not even be possible to struggle against him. One who has realized the world of equality will regard with compassion even people who have homicidal intentions, since in a fundamental sense they and oneself are of equal worth. In the same way, all of nature, mountains, and rivers, are seen as oneself. In this deeper realization of oneness you will feel the preciousness of each object in the universe, rejecting nothing, since things as well as people will be seen as essential aspects of yourself. This deeper awareness, mind you, comes only after your practice has fully matured. Let us take the body as a concrete example of the absolute equality of things. In the realization of the sameness aspect, of each object having equal value, your face and the soles of your feet are not different, one is not high and the other low. Similarly, a lawbreaker is not inherently evil, nor is a law-abiding person a pillar of virtue. Nevertheless, for society to function harmoniously, people who go against the accepted laws who kill or steal, for example must be segregated for the protection of others. This being true, it is clear that there is another aspect, that of relativity in this case, of moral distinctions. To understand and act upon differences is not a simple matter. For example, one who truly understood differentiation and could function in accordance with it would never overeat, he or she would eat only when hungry, and then just enough to satisfy hunger. Ordinary people who have not yet awakened think they understand the relative, common world of distinctions, but true understanding can take place only when the aspect of oneness has been realized in depth. Having experienced the world of equality through Kensho, one now sees differences in and through the aspect of sameness. When I first came to America and looked into the faces of the people, they all looked alike. But now I can differentiate faces here quite easily. You can help people only when you are able to recognize and accept the differences among them, seeing each individual in the light of his or her own unique qualities. To do so represents an advanced state of training. Even after Kensho, when you perceive that everything is one and you are no longer confronted by an external world, you still cannot live in and through that experience. Somehow you keep returning to the previous state of mind. However, if you continue work on subsequent koans, each time you resolve another koan, that experience is reaffirmed and you return to the world of non-duality with great clarity. Gradually the clarity and the ability to live in this world of oneness improve. So there is both suddenness and gradualness in Zen training. The experience of awakening is sudden but the integration of the experience into your life is gradual. To awaken quickly is not necessarily advantageous, nor is to take a long time necessarily disadvantageous. When you practice earnestly each day, you are actualizing in your life the aspect of oneness. Though not even striving for enlightenment, one is gradually becoming aware of the world of equality through wholehearted, single-minded zazen. Hearing this last, you may think, if through wholehearted zazen in our daily life we are actualizing the Kensho state of mind, what need is there to think about Kensho? As you have heard me say many times, when you are involved in zazen to the point of self-transcendence, that is, enlightenment manifesting itself. Therefore it is said in Zen, one minute of sitting, one minute of being a Buddha. Zazen is the cause of which enlightenment is the effect. 
but since this cause and effect are simultaneous, or one, you are not consciously aware of this enlightenment. Realizing this intrinsic enlightenment suddenly exclaiming, oh, this is it, is something else again. This latter is a distinct effect, different from cause and effect are one, and its realization requires the strong faith that one can awaken to one's true nature. This vital point must not be overlooked. 11. The three essentials of Zen practice What I am about to say is especially applicable. Today Jo Zen, which is specifically directed toward Satori, but it also embraces Sejiho, though in a lesser degree. The first of the three essentials of Zen practice is strong faith, Dei Shinkan. This is more than mere belief. The ideogram for Kan means root, and that for Shin, faith. Hence the phrase implies a faith that is firmly and deeply rooted, immovable, like an immense tree or a huge boulder. It is a faith, moreover, untainted by belief in the supernatural or the superstitious. Buddhism has often been described as both a rational religion and a religion of wisdom. But a religion it is, and what makes it one is this element of faith, without which it is merely philosophy. Buddhism starts with the Buddha's supreme enlightenment, which he attained after strenuous effort. Our deep faith, therefore, is in his enlightenment, the substance of which he proclaimed to be that human nature, all existence, is intrinsically whole, flawless, omnipotent in a word, perfect. Without unwavering faith in this the heart of the Buddha's teaching, it is impossible to progress far in one's practice. The second indispensable quality is a feeling of strong doubt, Digaton, Point 42 Not a simple doubt, mind you, but a doubt mass and this inevitably stems from strong faith. It is a doubt as to why we and the world should appear so imperfect, so full of anxiety, strife and suffering, when in fact our deep faith tells us exactly the opposite is true. It is a doubt which leaves us no rest. It is as though we knew perfectly well we were millionaires and yet inexplicably found ourselves in dire need without a penny in our pockets. Strong doubt, therefore, exists in proportion to strong faith. I can illustrate this state of mind with a simple example. Take a man who has been sitting smoking and suddenly finds that the pipe which was in his hand a moment before has disappeared. He begins a search for it in the complete certainty of finding it. It was there a moment ago, no one has been near, it cannot have disappeared. The longer he fails to find it, the greater the energy and determination with which he hunts for it. From this feeling of doubt the third essential, strong determination, Daifunchi, naturally arises. It is an overwhelming determination to dispel this doubt with the whole force of our energy and will. Believing with every pore of our being in the truth of the Buddha's teaching that we are all endowed with the Immaculate Bodhi mind, we resolve to discover and experience the reality of this mind for ourselves. The other day someone who had quite misunderstood the state of mind required by these three essentials asked me, is there more to believing we are Buddhas than accepting the fact that the world as it is is perfect, that the willow is green and the carnation red? The fallacy of this is self-evident. If we do not question why greed and conflict exist, why the ordinary man or woman acts like anything but a Buddha, no determination arises in us to resolve the obvious contradiction.